Dr. Jean Goodwin to our sanctuary. She's presented here several times to UU, even once talking about our UU saint. She is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in private practice in Galveston, or was. She is a clinical professor of psychiatry at UTMB and a training and supervising analyst on the faculty of the Center for Psychoanalytic Studies in Houston. She's an author, lecturer, and consultant on issues of childhood trauma and dissociation. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, we might try uh, putting up the first slide, just uh, in case nothing works. <laughs> Great. Let's let's leave it there because it's pretty. Um, farewell to a beloved office. Growing up is an endless process of saying goodbye. Goodbye to the baby blanket, to the Barbie dolls, to the dog-eared college textbooks, to that first piece of furniture that was actually one's own. Perhaps most difficult is to say goodbye to middle adulthood, a time of life when we often feel most powerful, most useful, and real. Today, I'm starting to say goodbye to my office, the waiting and consulting rooms I have shared with patients and trainees for over a quarter century. Any goodbye is good practice for all of us entering older adulthood. There will be lots of farewells to the family home, to departing and dying friends, and eventually to that most steadfast of friends, one's own body. So I'm starting out the way I start out my day with my commute to my beloved office, uh, driving along the seawall, seeing the sea. When we moved to Galveston in 1992, I wondered if I would eventually tire of looking at the water, but I never did. Seeing the horizon counts also as a never-ending blessing, always that horizon as near to me as it is untouchably far away. Next slide. This is the... Uh, Whoops, this is the next slide. Thank you. Uh, this is what I see when I open the door into my office. Um, and you see there is a happy Buddha there, the little brown thing. Uh, he guards the door. He was given to me by my mentor when I came to MD Anderson at age 17 for a summer science internship. That was 1963, post Sputnik. And the powers that be, as they often do, had decided that more teens needed to get interested in science and technology rather than in sex and rule breaking. <laughs> These days we called that STEM. My mentor, Mary, ran the computer at Anderson, a computer which went on for miles and miles and could do much less than my current iPhone. Mary had graduated from Reed College in Oregon, so she had a head start on the 60s. She told me to rub the Buddha's stomach for luck 
and she loaned me Simone de Beauvoir's Memoirs of a Dutiful Daughter. Oh, I'm glad that the children left because this is going to be R-rated. <laughs> <laughs> Armed with these hints, I went on that summer to read Camus in French and to watch as many Fellini films and as many Ingmar Bergman films as I could find. I also fell in love with a fellow student, a guy who hitchhiked so extensively and sailed sailboats so far and wide that my parents christened him the pirate. As Camus taught me that summer, it is necessary to fall in love, if only to provide an alibi for all those random moments of despair. The pirate still calls occasionally, mostly during hurricanes. My husband, the geriatrician, says that he calls to make sure that I am safe and in hopes that my husband is not. <laughs> Yet another portentous moment of that summer involved field trips to UTMB in Galveston. I remember loving the idea that someone in the 19th century had had the wit to put a medical school in the midst of all these sandy beaches and the sea and the ever-present horizon. Looking back, I wonder if perhaps I was always meant to live on this island. Also guarding the doorway, you can see her just beyond the Buddha, is Leonardo da Vinci's sketch of the head of the Virgin. I always feel safe with Leonardo. He's one of my saints. Freud loved him too and wrote a paper about him. It's a mercy when the things that you love love each other. Speaking of love, that book of Leonardo paintings is the only one I claimed from Malcolm Brodwick's library after he died. Hard to go wrong with Leonardo, equally hard to go wrong with Mother Mary. My favorite story about Mary is the one about the young nun who, as she was climbing out the window to meet her lover, remembered to pray to Mary that no one would find out. And so at midnight, when the head nun came around to take roll call, it was Mary who took the young nun's place under the covers, and no one ever found out. Next slide. Yeah, no, 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 back, back. <laughs> that one. Good work. Um, this is the fireplace in my office. Um, that was one of the reasons I picked it. Uh, there were other more sensible reasons. It has a front door and a back door, so you can leave without having to worry too much about running into someone you know. But the fireplace enchanted me. So the first thing I did back in 1998 when I moved in was to set a fire, to lay a fire, a wood fire in the fireplace, and to light it. Of course, the chimney did not work, and the fire engine came, and a big black scorch was left on the wall. I immediately covered the scorch up with our youngest daughter's baby blanket. She was a teenager already and no longer needed it. The baby blanket is still there, and behind it, I think, the scorch is still there as well. In addition to the fire, my Traumatized office has also been through three floods over the years. The floods have all been burst pipes or water heaters, never storms. We have the good luck to inhabit somewhat of a bump on the seawall, which protects us. The office is right behind the San Luis Hotel, which is where Geraldo Rivera tied himself to a palm tree during Hurricane Ike. We had already evacuated, but when I saw Geraldo on TV, I knew the office would be safe and dry when I got back. <laughs> Geraldo would never risk a single hair on his mostly empty head. <laughs> and I was right, the office did fine. Next slide. 
Yeah, this is the waiting area. And usually there are flowers in the waiting room. I perhaps inherited this habit from Heinz Kohat, one of the dead Viennese psychoanalysts that I read and teach and revere. He always had flowers in his room, even if he was staying at a hotel. Kohat was an expert on narcissism. Some of his detractors point to this flower habit of his as evidence that he himself might have had issues with narcissism. And that was perhaps the source of his expertise. I prefer to think of my own flower habit as an example of normal narcissism. <laughs> I once asked one of my beloved mentors, Dr. Wells, of whom you will hear more later, to define normal narcissism. It is the fact, he said in his wonderful Hungarian accent, that your jacket is exactly the same color as your eyes. Next slide. Yes, this is a shelf filled with peculiar books. Uh, we are now in my consulting room, looking at the clock on the bookshelf, the clock that keeps me on schedule all day as I map out each therapy hour. Next to the clock is a penguin standing on a book called A Deadly Silence. This is the only book amongst those that inhabit the 100 feet of bookshelves in this office, in which I feature as a character. It is a true crime book about high school kids who managed in a kind of comedy of errors to kill an incest father. A super condensed version of the story would go something like this. Cheryl tells her boyfriend Rob about the incest. It is the first time she's ever told anyone. Rob says, this is awful, we should do something. Cheryl says that it's no use, nothing can be done. Then she thinks maybe they could hire a hitman, but then neither of them knows a hitman. Except there is Sean, who has the desk behind Cheryl's, and who they don't know all that well. But Sean has been listening. Sean volunteers. His dad is a policeman, and Sean has access to weapons. So before any of them has thought very much about the matter, Cheryl finds her father one morning, shot dead in the driveway. By the time I flew in to be an expert witness, all three kids were in jail. This is what the true crime book says about my testimony. She was a petite woman, with blunt-cut shoulder-length hair and wide, intelligent eyes. She had a small, non-threatening voice that made technical terms sound almost friendly. Her polite, anxiety, her polite uh, informative manner exuded preci precision. And later, talking to the judge, I say that Cheryl scored high on anxiety, depression, and hostility. Judge Sherman wanted to know, was there anxiety because she was under indictment for murder? Sure, Dr. Goodwin replied cheerfully, but then without missing a beat, re resumed her highly clinical description. Then on cross-examination, I am asked how many cases of father-daughter incest I have seen. Quote, Dr. Goodwin replied that it was hard for her to estimate, but it was somewhere around 600. Any leading to death? Well, one girl burned her home. One girl's brother beat the father to death. I've never heard of a case like this, unquote. So that's me on the witness stand. The story ended about as well as one could hope. Cheryl got time served and probation. Rob did a year in prison. They are still married and have two daughters. Sean was in prison for almost two decades, during which time he graduated from college and began volunteering for a nonprofit that educates inmates. 
he is now executive director of that outfit and married. I have the feeling, listening to interviews now with Sean, that he might do it all over again. Next slide. Yes, uh, this is a beautiful card. This card was made for me by a very difficult patient. I saw her when I was still a resident and in supervision with Dr. Wells, the old Hungarian guy who once noticed the color of my eyes. This is a poem I wrote sometime after the patient had gotten well and after Dr. Wells had died. It is called Supervision with Dr. Wells. This is how it goes. He hit me, she hit me, and I got frightened. Stop, I said, or I'll call the cops. I'm afraid it's all over. You can't stop now, he said. It means too much to both of you. This is the letter you must write to her. Say, some days are sunny, but some are not. Tuesday was a bad day. That, like clouds, will blow away. You are in treatment because you want what's best for you. I am your doctor, and I too want the best for you. I hope you decide to come back. Yes, I said. That is just right. And wondered why he said, Thank you for appreciating, not realizing until after that those were the last words between us. Next slide. This is a more peculiar bookshelves. Um, you may have noticed that penguins loom large on my bookshelves. Um, this is because the penguin was my nickname for my beloved analyst. He was a rather stiff and proper fellow, and he had great difficulties in turning off the ringer on his telephone. I would be lying on the couch and would hear him trying to punch the correct button with his awkward penguin wings <laughs> until at last the ringing would stop. I understand this much better these days because now I now have exactly the same type of dysfunctional telephone. <laughs> and now my patients, too, must listen to me trying to quiet it with my awkward penguin wings. There is also on the shelf below a Japanese doll brought to me by a patient who came from Japan. I had thought these dolls were mere playthings for tourists and children, but it turns out that whenever in the old days you committed infanticide on a daughter, you had to carve one of these dolls to remember. The person who gave it to me felt that the wooden doll was about all that was left of her. Next slide. This is my desk. And hanging above it is a painting of a garden in Magdala on the Sea of Galilee, the town that Mary Magdalene came from. She is probably the best candidate for a patron saint for those of us dealing with dissociation and multiple personality. After all, Jesus, the rabbi carpenter, cast out seven devils for her. I prefer to think that he integrated them. <laughs> and the Bible scholars keep arguing about whether she was one woman or two woman, women or three or maybe even seven. When it comes to the Magdalene, I am a lumper rather than a splitter. I go with all the medieval fairy tales about her, that she was the bride at the wedding at, at Cana and that the Apostle John was the groom, and that when he abandoned her to be a monk, she, in her misery and spite, became a harlot. Actually, a courtesan, she made a great deal of money at it. That she was the woman at the well, 
and the woman who anointed the feet of Jesus and the woman they were about to stone for adultery when Jesus rode in the sand and stopped it. Have I gotten to seven self-states yet? Also the sister of Martha and Lazarus and the apostle to the apostles who witnessed the resurrection and the missionary to France who arrived in a rudderless boat and the penitent hermit who inhabited a cave in Provence. Many different self-states in one body revolving around one soul. I should point out that in this opinion, I differ with the Catholic Church. That is a long list of disagreements. A, a priest once told me that um, God loves it when we complain and disagree. Apparently, God craves um, company and doesn't get much of it. So a long argument is about as good as it get, ever gets for God. I don't think the Catholic Church operates on exactly those lines, however. I can imagine that Mary Magdalene might find the flower house in the painting to be a familiar and a safe place. She might even feel kind of safe in this room looking into that painted garden. Most days, I do too. Next slide. This is the last slide. Uh, this is the toy closet. The only real headway I have made on packing up the office is that I donated my play therapy toys to another clinic, except not quite all of them. These are the ones that I kept. There is the Wicked Witch of the West, Grumpy the Dwarf from Snow White, the Unemotional Tin Man, the Greedy Little Piggy, the Extinct Buffalo and His Hunters. They are just little things, but St. David of Wales told us to take care of the people God has given us and to always remember the little things. And of course, every one of these little figures is me. Also, there is a canoe. H.D., a poet and one of Freud's early patients, wrote to him after she had completed her psychoanalysis. She said that everything was pretty much the same. Same problematic people, same hard, hard life, except, she said, now I have a canoe. The office has more or less been my canoe. I hope it has felt that way to other people. Now I have to find a way to make it portable. Thank you. Lots to think about. Thank you, Jean. So thoughtful.